Praise the Lord. You're a little farther out today because of the baptismal tank, but that's okay. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. There we go, Brian. And um, it's time of worship. How many of y'all enjoyed worship this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that you can come worship the Lord freely? How many of y'all know this, this is a different type of worship, but it's still worship? We're acknowledging who God is. You know, in one of the letters to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul, he connects believers' generosity with the grace of God. And that shouldn't be surprising, especially since the fact that God giving us his love and favor without our earning it is a foundational Christian um, theological concept. God's grace towards us in Christ, the ultimate act of generosity. And I think because of that, we should be able to reflect that back to the world we live in and to the God that we serve. Amen. So let me read to you again what I shared a, a scripture passage last Sunday, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2. It says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So apparently the Macedonian believers were going through a time where they were experiencing a very severe trial, but their hardship didn't stop their generosity. And I say that to tell you this this morning, you may be going through a time right now where you say, man, pastor, money's tight, times are tough. And I will challenge you that during those days is the best time to be generous. Because when you show your generosity, God in turn, it opens up your hands for him to do something with what you have. And, uh, you know, the Macedonian church, they, they were they were going through a severe time but their generosity didn't shrivel up. And I want to commend you this morning as a church because we still give to missions no matter what we're going through economy-wise. We've never stopped. One of the things that impressed me the most about this church when I came in, and I think we only had like 35 people that first Sunday, was the fact that you all were still supporting all of your missionaries. And I thought, that's fantastic. That's the type of church I want to pastor. A church that no matter where they're at financially, they realize the importance that there are other people depending upon them. Well, how many of y'all know that we're, we're larger than that now, but people are still depending upon us. And missionaries are still asking for money, and there's still air conditioning and heat and all those other things that we have to cover, uh, building repairs and all of that. And it's because of your faithfulness that we were able to do what God's called us to do. So there's different ways that you can give. You can see it up there. And um, we'll take it any way you want to give it. God honors that. So, Heavenly Father, may you bless the offering this morning. May you bless it. May we realize, dear God, that as recipients of, of your lavish generosity, that uh, we are able to give because of what you've given to us. We thank you for that. May you bless those who give, dear God, because they're fulfilling your word. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. We have a lot going on. If you don't know what the Situation is this tonight at the, at the high school. We all gather together in front of the high school, those who want to join us. And then what we do is after a period of time together, we split up and we cover the schools, walking around them, praying for them, praying that God does something special in our schools, praying that God uses our teachers, praying that God uses our students, praying that they're just covered in prayer. Amen. How many of y'all believe that our schools need that nowadays? Amen. So uh, come out and be a part of that. I know it might be a little toasty. But hey, if you can do it for other things, you can do it to pray. And uh, come out and join us. Also, I, just, I would just ask that um, Paul is not very, um, how do I put this? She's not real good with directions sometimes. And uh, she used to always call me before we had GPS systems like, I'm, I, can't, I can't find my way home. And uh, where am I? And I'd say, well, where are you? And uh I says, what, what, you know, what landmark do you see? And I remember one time saying, well, I see this water tower. It says Grand Prairie. I said, well, you're not in Duncanville then. You've gone about 20 miles past, and you turn around. Well, I, didn't think of the, I say that to say this. She left this morning about 7.30 on her way back with Steve, and she requested that I pray that she get her way back. Now, she's got a GPS system, and she's got all that, but if I don't see her by Wednesday, I'm going to be concerned. So, uh, you know. She's supposed to get back tonight. And, uh, so, and so while you're praying for her, you might want to pray for me because uh, as she comes back, she's coming back with her brother. And uh, we're going to go from never having had kids to having a 62-year-old 60, live with us. And, uh, and it's going to be a bit of adjustment. 
but I know God's got all everything under control. Amen. And uh, she keeps telling me, Rick, I love you so much because I know this is a big step for you and understanding all this. And I tell her, don't worry about it. It's all going to be fine. It'll all work out. But I can tell by her voice and her concern that she's almost more worried about me than she is Steve moving in with us. So uh, maybe I need prayer. So I'm throwing it out there, okay? Pray for me. Okay, if you look in your bulletin, you'll see a sheet of paper to kind of help you along. This morning, as you well know, we've been on this series, started last Sunday on Unshakable, Thriving No Matter What They Throw At You, and we're looking at lessons from the life of Daniel, a great hero in the Old Testament. I think there's more adventure in his life. There's more political intrigue, uh, death threats, this raw courage. I think that, uh, his, I think his life would make a better movie than, than the Raiders of the Lost Ark or the Mission Impossibles or the, you know, the, the Born Conspiracies, all that, because all those are fake and his life is real. And it starts as, as him being a 15 year old and it ends up when he's about 85 and it's an amazing story. And if I can just refresh the background this morning, to let you remember what we talked about, the nation of Israel has fallen into a spiritual decline. Uh, God's not really happy with what's taking place. They have fallen into idolatry, immorality, and injustice, the things that we have in our society today. And there's a reason why God's upset. And, Jer- and there's prophets back in those days. There's Jeremiah, Isaiah, there's Zephaniah. And they're saying that we need to get our act together. We're going to lose our freedom. Uh, we're going to, the freedom as a nation, if we don't get things done. And sure enough, 586 BC, God allowed the most powerful empire of that time, the Babylonian Empire run by Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and over, and just devastate the country. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they took 25% of the population as prisoners of war, uh, for 70 years. And most of those, they lived and died in a foreign country. And one of those carried off as a prisoner of war was a young man, a young teenager named Daniel, 15 years old. And as we talk over the weeks, I want you to remember this. He is separated from his parents. He never gets to go back to his home country. The rest of his life, it's a rags the riches story, basically, when you look at his life. And he saves the empire, and he actually outlasts three administrations. You've got Nebuchadnezzar. You got Belteshazzar, uh, the Babylonian Empire, later on Cyrus the Great, uh, the Persians come in and they kill off everybody, but they keep Daniel. There's something about Daniel. And he actually leads two of these three emperors, uh, into a knowledge of who God is. At 85 years old, he's retired and they have to pull him out of retirement to save the empire once again. And that's what we're going to see as the, as the weeks roll on. And we begin to see tests that take place in Daniel's life. Daniel's a model of life at every stage. He has tests when he's a teenager, midlife, and finally at retirement, which means there's something in his story for each one of us. No matter what age you are, you can say, you know what, that could be a part of me. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, uh, 3, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. So I want to give you a life principle this morning to write down. That would be this. Before every blessing, there's always a testing. Before every blessing, there's always a testing. The Lord will test the heart. And he tests your heart before every blessing, there's a testing. So so if you're going to be blessed by God, just realize you're going to be tested by God. Just realize the fact this morning that if you're going to be used by God, he's probably going to test you first. Um, he wants to make sure that you're ready to handle the power, that you're ready to handle the, the blessing, the influence, whatever he wants to give. So what does God test when he tests you? And I'll say this. He tests primarily the first thing would be your character. He looks at your character. He looks at your integrity. He looks at your humility. He looks at your generosity. He looks at your loyalty. He looks at your faithfulness. He looks at your truthfulness. He tests your character. And if you pass the test, you get promoted. And if you get promoted, you get more power. And then you get promoted, you get more power. So I think this is one reason. And then I also believe that he actually reveals things to you that he doesn't reveal to everybody else. I think the more that you mature in your walk, the more God reveals things to you, that there are people around you. He says, I just can't reveal it to them. They can't handle it right now. 
In fact, if you want to know somebody else who was that way, I think, I think that is why Paul was taught so much. He actually wrote so much of the New Testament because God spoke to him more than he speaks to you or me. You want to know why? It says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, this is the reason. We speak God's message because God tested us and trusted us to do it. When we speak, we're not trying to please people. In other words, I'm not conforming. But God who tests our heart. God tested, God trusted. In Daniel's story, his character is tested over and over and over again. And each time he passed the test, he got more influence. He got more power. I say that to tell you this this morning. Maybe you're going through a test, or maybe you've just gone through one, and you're saying, I'm glad that's over. I'm here to tell you that that one's over. Get ready for the next one. Your life is going to be a period of stages where you are being tested over and over again. In fact, Daniel is the only guy in history besides John the Apostle, John the Apostle who wrote the book of Revelations, who uh, they're actually told how the world's going to end. They were trusted that much with how they've been tested that Daniel actually predicts the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, and, and how things are going in. Why did God show that to Daniel? I believe in part it was because he had tested him. He had passed the test. So he says, you know what? I can trust you. So let me give you one other principle to write down. That's this. God tests us with stress before he trusts us with success. How many of y'all hate stress? How many of y'all will see a name on a telephone is like, don't want to answer that one? Because you know that person's name is associated to stress. Yeah, don't want to go there. There are times when I'm, as a pastor, where I'll get a, the phone will ring, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm the only person here. Do I really need to answer this one? If it's really important, they'll leave a voice message. But how many of y'all know that sometimes you just have to answer? And you can feel the stress sh- slowly building up. I have a friend, is, um, I had a friend, Dick Fulmer, and um, he, he ran the uh, military ministries in Europe. And he got to a certain age where he told my dad, he says, I just can't do this job anymore. And my dad asked him why. And he says, well, he says, uh, when I get with all these colonels and we have a meeting, he says, there are certain ones that I see there. He says, I can feel the stress rising in me. He says, I feel like I'm choking. And I, I have to, I can't do this anymore. I have to stop. And... How many of y'all have ever felt like you've been there? You're in a situation, you're in a board meeting, you're in a certain room with a certain group of people, and you feel the stress. I'm going to tell you this morning, Daniel's tested many times, and we're going to look at a few of these tests as we go through these weeks. And we're going to find out how we can overcome those to become what God wants us to be. Now, last week, we talked about the fact when you go through a major change. And we talked about how that, that affects our life. If you missed that message, there are five things in life you want. Just go back, look at it online, and you can dig it up, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But this morning, I want to talk about the test of social pressure. I want to talk about the test that when you're pressured to conform to something, um, and you know it's not right, whatever your boss is trying to do, or the government, or a certain authority in life, what do you do? Or I want to maybe better would be put would be when you feel pressured by your peers, the the pressure of others to do something when you know it isn't right. How do you handle the situation? How do you do that? In this story, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, if he takes 25% of the nation of Israel hostage, he takes them to Babylon, he moves them there, and then he says, pick out the smartest, take out, pick out the best looking, uh, the brightest, the most gifted teenagers, and I want to do something with them. Now, I, as I wrote that, I thought, you know what? Some of you would qualify for that. Now, I also thought, Some of you in the front row here would qualify. But then I thought, a lot of you wouldn't because you're too old. That's the only reason. If you were younger, he might have taken you. But out of those, Daniel gets picked. 15 years old. 
And then he says, you're going to go through a three-year indoctrination program. During this program, I'm basically going to wipe out your memory of Israel. Uh, my plan is uh, you don't need your God. We're going to make you more like us. We're going to brainwash you, train for three years. Then you're going to serve in my royal palace. And he said, I'm going to teach you a new language. I'm going to teach you a, a new culture. I'm going to teach you new habits, a new religion, and I'm going to give you new names. I talked about that last Sunday, but I want to, I want to read that scripture one more time before I get into this this morning. Daniel 1 7, because it says this, the boys were all given new Babylonian names. Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar, and Hananiah was renamed Shadrach, Misha was renamed Meshach, and Azariah was renamed Abednego. And I began to look at this, and what does this mean? What's going on here? Why are, are they getting new names? They're getting new names, just so you know, because all of their Hebrew names refer to God. Truly God in Hebrew. So they're given names after pagan gods. And how many of y'all know that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're called a Christian? How many of y'all want to keep that name? Absolutely. The world's going to try and change it. Make it sound like something bad. And uh, But you want to keep that name. When you look at Daniel Hebrew, it means God is my judge. Uh, the name they gave him, Belteshazzar, means Bel protects me. A pagan, phony God. That was his new name. You look at Hananiah, his name in Hebrew means God is gracious. He was given the name Shadrach, which is the moon god of the Babylonians. Misha, whose name means in Hebrew, who is like God, or no one is as great as he is, is given the name Meshach, which is the fertility god in Babylon. Azariah, whose name in Hebrew means God has helped me, is named Abednego, which is another name, a servant evil, another pagan god. Every one of them are giving new names so that they can forget who they are, who their god is, and give it a name of a pagan god so they can be brainwashed and this is who I am. So they're given new names, they're given new identities, they're given new jobs, they're given new clothes, and finally they're given a whole new diet. This is the way you're going to eat. You're not going to eat like a Jewish diet anymore, and you're going to eat the Babylonian food, and a total reprogramming, a total assimilation process. And here's where we be in the story today. It says in Daniel 1.5, the king ordered that the young men, those in his program, should eat the same food and wine served at the king's table while they were being trained. So it's a three-year period. After that, they were to become servants of the king of Babylon. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself by eating the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official, that's the chief of staff there, for permission not to defile himself this way. You have to ask yourself, what is going on here? When you look at this story, I mean, anybody who's serious about athletes or a college team, athletics, that when you're in training, there is such a thing as a, as a training table. Uh, when a coach separates the athletes, says, okay, here's the way you're going to have to eat till, let's say, the Olympics. You're going to have to eat this way and do this, or you're a boxer. And uh, to get yourself in peak performance, otherwise you're going to defile yourself. And, and Daniel refused to go along with the program. I don't want to defile myself. I looked up that word defile. What does defile mean? In the English word, it means to, to corrupt or, or to pollute, to contaminate. It's a loss of purity. So the idea comes in, if you say you go to the party, the, the park to have a party, and the park is pristine, it's beautiful, but before you leave there, you just throw all your trash on the ground, you throw it all over the place. What have you done? You've defiled that park. It was clean and pure, now it's no longer that way. When you pour chemicals or toxic waste or sewage in a river, you've defiled that river. Understand what I'm saying? You've made something that was good, bad. He says, I'm not going to, to defile myself. So what's wrong with eating Babylonian food? What's the big deal? I mean, why did Daniel, he's 15 years old, take on the most powerful man in the world and say, I'm sorry, your food's not good enough. What's going on here? Well, I think there are three reasons Daniel refused to conform in this situation. And I want to just give them to you real quickly. One is a health reason. The king's food probably was a bit junky. A lot of gravies, a lot of sugar. And, uh, I mean, he's a king who, you know, uh, 
How many of y'all know what gout is? Gout is what they call rich man's disease. And uh, I'm not a rich man, but I have issues with gout. If I eat too much of that kind of rich food, uh, I, I will have issues. My big toe will get so sore, I can't even put a shoe on. And uh, years and years ago, in fact, I, when I hit 30, I thought I started having this problem with my big toe. And I thought, man, I sprained my big toe again. And uh, I thought, How? every time I'd come back to the States is when it would happen. If I was overseas, it would happen. But I came back, I thought, oh, gosh, I, what is it? And I was at a church getting ready to preach. And the pastor goes, I was at his house, you got gout. What's gout? He says, it's the stuff called rich man's disease. You eat these certain types of foods and the acids and they crystallize in your joints. And so I went to the doctor the next day and sure enough, he says, let's change your diet. We changed my diet. I still was having pretty much the same problem. He goes, well, it's also hereditary. Oh, okay. Well, none of my family's ever had gout. So I talked to my dad. My dad says, oh yeah, grandpa had gout. So-and-so had gout. Your uncle's got gout. Oh, oh great. It's my family's fault. But I always thought about the, the rich foods. And I think health-wise, uh, that was one reason not to eat. I think there's also a cultural reason here, a national reason, because the nation of Israel had very strict dietary laws. Uh, we call them kosher laws. And God separated them and says, here's the way you're going to eat. Here's the way you're going to do things. I have created you, and I have chosen you as a special people. So there's also that that side of it right there. So Daniel's, I'm, I'm supposed to eat this way. I'm a Jew. It's cultural. It's national. But I believe there's also a, a religious reason as well. And I know that Daniel's not rejecting this. Um, just let me give you two verses here. They're in the New Testament. First Timothy 4, 3 through 5. False teachers will order people to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. For everything that God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. So God says, uh, if I made it, you can eat it. Does that make sense? And uh, But how many of you know there's a lot of stuff out there that's man-made food? How many of you know, know that God did not create Twinkies? Yeah. Or Heath bars. Or all those other, you know, God did not create those. Basically, if, if I could put it in a... If it grows on, uh, on plants, it's probably good for you to eat. If it was made in a plant, it's probably bad for you to eat. And uh, you might, might want to avoid that. And, but Jesus even makes it one step farther. Jesus says this. He says in Matthew 15, 11, you are not defiled by what you eat. You are defiled by what you say and do. In other words... It's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. And how many of y'all know that to be true? What you say, not so much what you eat. But Daniel is rejecting this. Health reasons, national culture, and I think it's a spiritual attack on Daniel's identity. An attempt to reprogram, re reprogram him. To change everything, his name, and his diet. So there are four qualities that I want to throw out to you this morning that God looks for in your life. And if you'll follow these and understand them, I believe that you will get promoted and you will get blessed. But you will be tested to see if you have them. And it's in the food test. So number one, write this down. We're going to fly through this now. Integrity. He never forgot who he was. First test. He says, you can change my address. I can live here in Babylon. You can change my clothing. You can change my name, but you're not going to change my heart. Daniel 1.8 says, Daniel was determined not to defile himself. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. I'm not going to be conformed to society's values in this society. I have to tell you over and over and over again this morning, you cannot afford to conform to the values of the society that we live in today because they will defile you. You will lose the identity that you have. To say, well, you know what? I can be a Christian and, and also hold the world's values. No, you can't. The world's values today do not line up with God's values. They will defile you. 
Romans 12, 2 says, Don't conform yourself to the values of this world. Instead, let God transform you by a complete change of how you think. Then you will be able to know the will of God. So you have two choices in life. You, you, you can be conformed or you can be transformed. The choice is up to you of what you make. If you're conformed to the world like everybody else in the world, you look like them, you smell like them, you talk like them. If you're conformed to the world, you're in trouble. You have to be transformed by God. That has to take place in your life. I have people tell me all the time, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. And, you know, and blankety, blankety this. I don't know what, what is God's will for my life. Well, the first thing is quit being conformed to the world. Don't try and be like everybody else. You are a peculiar people. That's what the Bible says. You are God's wonderful weirdos. There's something unusual about you. You should stand out in the world you live in. The darker this world gets, the brighter you should become. Amen? Why? You're not conformed to the world. You're transformed by what God has done in your life. You're more interested in what God thinks than what everybody else thinks around you. And as long as you're worried about conforming, I got to look the same, talk the same, act the same, speak the same. I got to be cool. Everybody else like me. You're never going to know what God has for your life because you're looking to the wrong place. What's the second thing the test reveals? Number two is discipline because Daniel, he controlled his ego and his appetite. It says in Daniel 1.8, I'll read it again. Daniel made up his mind not to eat the food and wine given to them by the king. I'm sure it was gourmet stuff. A lot of good. But Daniel shows tremendous discipline. And I want you to remember again here that he's a teenager. He's a 15-year-old taken by force. Never going to see his parents again in a foreign country. So there's no parental supervision. The most powerful man in the country offers you perks. That's hard to turn down. You get to eat the king's food. Could you turn that down as a 15-year-old? We see this happen all the time in our world today. We see young kids who are good at football, basketball, or some other sport, and they're drafted, they're pulled off the streets, and... They're given enormous amounts of salaries, and they're treated like gods. They're driven around in these beautiful, expensive cars. Uh, They're given all kind of perks. Anything they mess up, they're they're, they're covered by their publicists. And how many of y'all have discovered a lot of them can't handle that success? Why? Well, they're a young person. It's hard to handle going from nothing to everything being thrown at you. We've got Heisman, older Heisman trophy winners who had tremendous talent, but after a while, they simply couldn't make it on a team. It wasn't so much that they lost their talent, they just simply didn't have the the character. They had character problems. And it's like, I don't want to mess with that. So Daniel's incredibly disciplined as a 15-year-old. He basically is saying, God put me here, you didn't. I'm not here without his permission. God has put me here. You're a pagan king, but I'm not going to be indebted to you. I'm not going to conform to you. I'm not going to be seduced by you. I am Jewish. I'm not Babylonian. And God made me to do this. An amazing amount of maturity for a 15-year-old. By the way, just because you can afford to buy something doesn't mean you have to buy it. He understands all this. Here's what it says in Romans 6, 13. Do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness. Use for sinning. Instead, give yourself completely to God. Because you want to be a tool in the hands of God, used for God, good purposes. This is the decision Daniel made as a teenager. I'm going to be used by God, not used by the world. I'm going to be used by God, not used by the culture. I'm going to be transformed by God, not conformed to the world. He had integrity. He had discipline. The third thing he had was courage. He was willing to stand alone. I think it took a great amount of courage 
for Daniel to, to, to ask the most powerful man in the world to exempt him from eating food. This could be like an insult. It would make this even more difficult was he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the only Jewish boy in the program. I mean, he had three friends who went along, went along with him. In fact, I think there were a lot of other Jewish young men who had been taken captain who saw no problem in eating the king's food. But Daniel said, um, I mean, they said everybody else is doing it. So why shouldn't I? How many of y'all know that when everybody else is doing it, doesn't mean you should do it? You are set apart. He was Jewish. I'm set apart. And, uh, and how many times did some of you use that with your parents, or maybe you do now? Hey, everybody else is doing it. Why can't I? I can remember telling my parents at times, hey, everybody else is going to that party. Why can't I go to that party? And then I came to a point in my life when I was still in high school where I understood the value of standing with courage. And when you do that, you have to be willing to stand alone. I have found over the years the majority is often wrong. History has proven that the majority is wrong so much of the time. God decides what truth is. And only God decides what's right and what's wrong. Exodus 23, 2, never follow the crowd in doing wrong. And don't be swayed in your testimony by the mood of the majority. How many of y'all know that we have values in this world right now that are just flat out wrong? Doesn't mean we have to go along with them. What's the fourth thing? The fourth thing is this, is he had humility. He was tactful with authority. He couldn't do what the authority asked him to do. He said, I can't do this. It's against my values. Um, it's morally wrong. It violates my conscience. And he was still very tactful with authority. That shows great humility. And the way that Daniel appealed uh, to the King Nebuchadnezzar, the way he showed his respect, he knew that God had allowed him to be where he was at, and he wasn't, this man wasn't a Christian, he wasn't a godly man, Nebuchadnezzar, but he knew that he had allowed this pagan leader to be his boss. Some of you, if you think, oh, I just got to have a bad boss, maybe you need to realize that God's allowed that person to be your boss for a reason. Maybe there's something that God wants to do. Here's what the Bible says in Daniel 1, 8 through 16. Then Daniel asked the chief official, for permission to eat other things instead. I want you to just notice something. He didn't demand it. He didn't rebel. Uh, he didn't say, I demand my rights. He asked permission. That's being respectful. How many of y'all believe you should always be respectful of authority? He was respectful. Now, God had given the chief official great respect for Daniel. Daniel's been there less than a year He's a 15-year-old, but this kid is doing something spectacular. He earns the respect of a pagan official. And it says here, but he said, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who ordered that you eat his food and wine. And if you aren't as healthy as others, I fear the king will have me beheaded. How many of y'all know that's a legitimate concern? If you don't eat what he tells you to eat, and he sees you all riveled up and, you know, it's sometimes the look that people have when they're fasting. I'm a believer that when you fast, you should look as good as when you're eating. But I've known good Christian saints who, when they're fasting, they walk around like this. And I'll say, is everything okay? Yeah, I'm on a fast. Like, you're not supposed to tell everybody. That's between you and God. And he was concerned. Legitimate concern. So next, Daniel talked it over with the guard appointed to look after Daniel and his three friends. So he talked it over. He doesn't make demands. He's not belligerent. And it says there, just test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water and see how healthy we look compared to the young men eating at the king's food. Then you can decide. So he leaves it up to this guy, the authority. 
whether or not to let us continue eating our diet. So the attendant agreed to try Daniel's suggestions. And then it says, at the end of 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than any of the others in the king's training program. So after that, the guard let, him, let them eat their own food. And finally in Daniel 1, 18 through 19, it says, when the three-year training program was completed, all the young men were brought to King Nebuchadnezzar, who talked with each one individually. None impressed the king as much as Daniel and his three friends. So what took place? They were each promoted to positions in the king's service. You might want to circle that word promoted, because this is the first promotion we're going to see. There's five in his lifetime. And he never gives up his integrity. He never compromises his convictions, and he still soars. In a pagan society, a pagan world, he's not just surviving, he's thriving. He's growing in, inf in influence. By the time that three-year training program is, is over, if, I'm, if my math is right, he's now 18, 15 plus 3. So what do you do when someone is in authority and they ask you to do something that violates your conscience. Something you would be disobedient to what God says to do. Here's the deal. You need to know how to make an appeal. You need to know how to, to make your case. And you're going to have this test in your life over and over again. Lots of people in the Bible... Many of them came up with good appeals. Queen Esther in her time came up with a great appeal. Uh, Joseph made an appeal to, to Pharaoh. You find that uh, Paul in the Bible many times appealed to, to pagan Roman government officials. Daniel here makes an appeal. How do you make a case to an authority? You need this certain skill, and you're going to have to use it over and over again. So I wanted to share with you a few things that you can do, that we can learn from Daniel. Number one is this. Develop a reputation for responsibility. Write that down. Before you ever make an appeal to your employer or anybody else, you have to develop a reputation for responsibility. Daniel already had great respect, guys. You know why? Because he had developed this. His attitude, his, uh, his consistency, his loyalty, his character qualities. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 29. If you do your job well, leaders will notice and you will serve before kings. You know what serve before kings means? In a nutshell, you'll get promoted. If you do this, you're going to get promoted. And the fact is, people with great responsibility notice people who are responsible. There's something about it. You're able to pick up those traits and you can see it. Christians should have the best reputation in the marketplace. I said Christians should have the best reputation in the marketplace. We should be the best people to hire of everybody in society. We should be the ones that everybody wants. Hey, I'm looking for a Christian. I'm looking for, you don't want to know why? Because we should be the most responsible. We should be the best citizens. We should be the hardest workers. We should be the most trustworthy. We should be the most consistent. You should be the best employee where you work. You should be the most responsible, the hardest worker. Somebody listened to Daniel because he already had a track record. He was consistent. What's number two? Number two is this. Be humble and not belligerent. Hello? Why do Christians feel like they should be belligerent sometimes? It beats me. We should be humble. Why? I think attitude determines acceptance. When you're making a case in front of an authority, uh, and I'm not teaching you how to make a demand. I'm teaching you how to, how to make a case. In other words, he, does, he, didn't, he didn't say, I can't eat the king's food. I make a sign. I won't eat. I won't eat. I won't eat. That's being belligerent. If I eat it, you'll go to hell. You know, that's being belligerent. No, you don't see this attitude here. 
He's simply humbly going behind the scenes. Can we work on this? Can we find a way to work this out? How many of Christians have a hard time doing that sometimes? Uh, Proverbs 25, 6, when you stand before the king, that's before an authority, don't try to impress him and pretend to be important. What's the opposite of not trying to be important? Well, be humble. Be that person who is humble. Be humble or you'll stumble. Only I can think of to put with that. So what's number three? Don't be deceptive or manipulative. If you've got a case to make with the government or, or with your boss or your teacher, anybody, you know, I'm sorry I can't do this. It's against my conscience. Don't lie about it. I, um, that's not going to strengthen your case by being deceptive. I remember when I was in the 80s and I was in Spain, and I can't remember which war it was that we got into. But all of a sudden, I had these sailors in my church. I was pastoring a military and Navy church. And all of a sudden, they were saying, this, is, this violates my rights to go to war and to fight for our country. I thought, what? They said, well, and one guy says, well, I joined the Navy because I wanted my education paid for. I said, but you do understand that when you join the military, you might go to war. But it violates my conscience. Then why did you sign up? As the bottom line is, you don't want to do it. So now you're being deceptive and you're lying. And he didn't like that. In fact, quite a few of them didn't like it. It was a time when all of a sudden everybody, everybody was wanting to pull out of the military because oh, we're going to war. Guys, that's what happens when you sign up. That's part of being in the military. The last thing you want to do is, is lie. Because you know why? God can't help you then. You put yourself in your own little case. 2 Corinthians 4.2, we reject all shameful and underhanded methods. We do not try to trick anyone and we do not distort the word of God. That's integrity. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know that. So what's the fourth thing? The fourth thing is appeal to their goals and their interests. In other words, uh, the goals of those in authority, whoever's making whatever it is, this policy, start with what they want. And this is what Daniel does here. Daniel, he says, you know what? I think we have the same goal. You want us to be healthy. I think that's the goal you're shooting for. I don't have a problem with that. I want to be healthy. We're just disagreeing on how to get to that goal. And how many of you know that this is the way conversation gets started? This is the way you, you discuss that certain deal. And he says, you know what? Let's try a 10-day test. And that way it won't hurt you, it won't hurt them. No, And you can see after 10 days if my idea is working better than maybe the king's idea. And let's see if, if it'll work out. If it works out, it's a win-win for both of us. Everybody comes out ahead. And, um, but it says, he said there, then you decide. What does that do? It's saying, you're still in charge. I've not taken away your authority from me. You see, the problem so often is when we get into disagreements like this, we want to rip the other person's authority away from them. That's not your place. Your place is to come in humility and find a way to work the situation out where they believe they've won and you feel like you've won. And everything is good. So what's the fifth thing? Choose the right place, time, and words. In other words, uh, if you're a teenager and you want to go out on Friday night and your parents say, parents say no, you need to learn these laws how to have a case for your parents. So the first thing is the right place. And where's the right place? The right place is always privately. Don't make your demands. If you're going to upset with me and you want to make some demands, don't come in on Sunday morning in the foyer and confront me. Because that's not going to work. In fact, if you go to work and say, I demand, hey, boss, get out of your office. I got something to say to you. It may end up with you having your walking papers when it's done. You know why? That's his authority. 
Find a private place, a right way to do it. Find the right time. You know, kids, if you want to go out on Friday night, I'd advise you to lobby with your parents, not when they're tired and they've had a rough day, things have been bad, they haven't eaten yet. Wait until the glucose goes up in their body and, and they're a little more relaxed. You know, girls, just go up to your dad and as he's watching TV, say, Dad, I love you so much. You are the greatest dad in the world. You know, compared to all my friends, nobody's got a dad like you. Dad, would you mind if I went out with my friends? After you've buttered them up and basted them, you might get a better answer. Proverbs 16.21 tells you that the other thing, that's the right words. Got the right time, the right words. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Boy, memorize that scripture. I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. You got to do it the right way. And um, so understand you have to have a right time. You have to have the right words in the right place. What's the last thing? That's this. Trust God if they reject your appeal. Now, Daniel, his appeal worked. And, um, and if your appeal doesn't work, I want you to hold on to this promise. It's Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for good to those who love God according to his promise. How many of you know that's not a promise for everybody? That's only a promise for his children. Okay? Understand that. That's a promise for you if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Not everything is good in the world. Daniel does all the right things in making his appeal. He gets the exemption. And I want you to remember again, 15 years old, taking on the most powerful man in the world. When you confront somebody with authority, I want you to remember something. And I didn't give you a place to write this down. I'm just throwing this in in one minute. Realize that there are four things you need to remember that when you're all alone and you're out there on a limb. First of all, Jesus is with me. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when you're in that position, Jesus is with me. Number two, the Holy Spirit's in me. Amen? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've got that. I have the promises of God on my side. You've got over 6,000 promises in the Word of God that you can apply those to your life, and they're, they are for you. And I have God's family all around me. That's why, aren't you thankful you're in a church where you're not sitting, and there's nobody else around you here, but you have people around you. Daniel excelled without compromising his convictions. I want you to be a church that's unshakable. You don't have to compromise your convictions to stand true to what God has for you this morning. Daniel proves to us that in the world that we live in, we can put our trust in him. There's one last scripture you see there on your notes, and I had to put it in because I love the way it's worded. It's from the message paraphrase, but it sums up the, the courage and the character of Daniel. It says, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? You know, belief and unbelief. Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are, each of us. A temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way. I'll live in them and move into them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise. I'll be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. With promises like this, dear friends, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit and holy temples for the worship of God.
How many of y'all want to be that? That's what I want in my life. I want to be that holy temple that's filled with God in my life. Would you bow your heads just for a moment with me this morning? The world desperately needs Daniels today. Character doesn't matter anymore to most people. But God's looking for men and women who are unafraid of challenging our culture. Unafraid of the disapproval of others. We need modern day Daniels. And if you can say, Pastor, you know what? I want that conviction and character in my life. I don't want to cave into the culture that we live in today. This is my challenge to you. Could you say, I want that in my life? Would you just raise your hand? I want that in my life. I want that in my workplace. I want that when people see me. You know what? Your past is your past. It's over. What matters this morning is the direction your feet are heading right now. Will you have the courage to be a Daniel in your culture? Anybody else before we pray? Yes. Heavenly Father, I want to be a Daniel. I want to be a person of integrity, humility, generosity, discipline, courage. I want your blessings in my life more than I want the approval of our culture. That's what we're asking for this morning. So, dear Lord, we're we're proclaiming that we're willing to stand unafraid and unashamed. You have told us that you will be with us. I ask right now, may you give us the courage to do it. From the youngest person here to the oldest, you've covered the gamut in Daniel's life. So I know you cover us. Dear Lord, may we be those people that are unshakable. We thrive in the most dangerous of times because of what you've done in our lives. Dear Lord, may you cover us. May you protect us. May we pass the test and may you promote us because that's what you do. And we'll thank you for it this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I tell you this morning, there'll be times when you'll stumble. Those are things that take place. We serve a God who doesn't mind testing you because he wants to promote you. Amen. Don't you know there's a sweet presence here? The Spirit of the Lord. Aren't you glad you were able to come and celebrate with these who've been baptized? Could I pray a blessing over you that as you're being tested during the week. You will realize that. and You'll pass the test with flying colors because you know that with it comes promotion. With it comes blessing. Amen. So tests aren't something to dread. There's something just to be prepared for. I mean, whether you're prepared for them or not, you're still going to get them. So you might as well be prepared for them. Amen. So Heavenly Father, I ask right now for this congregation. May you cover us with your Holy Spirit. May he be behind us. May he be in front of us. May he be on our left and on our right. May he be above us, below us. Most important of all, may he be in us. Dear Lord, we simply ask that you cover us. Cover us so that whatever situation we're going through, whatever we are facing, we will know that you have allowed it, that you are with us, And you have made us more than conquerors. That means we have won. Dear God, may we come through it that the world might see that you are real, that you live. Give us a wonderful week. Cover us with blessings. We'll give you glory and praise. And everybody said, amen. May God bless you. May you have a wonderful week. Pray for Paula. She's still driving. God bless.